Welcome everyone to UC Berkeley Silicon Valley Startup Success Course. Today's week is all about emerging technologies. So let's get started. Our agenda for today consists of a 15 minute topic overview and then a one hour 30 minute session for our speaker Q&A and then the last 30 minutes for our discussion. All right, so let's begin by identifying the forces driving the technologies and their usage, adoption, and awareness. So no prizes for guessing this very first one. It is quite obvious that COVID is shaping almost all decisions, whether that is business related, personal, or otherwise. The next driving force for technology is digital transformation. And it's the fact that everyone's going digital. You make payments digitally. We are learning and interacting on a digital platform. And we also make a lot of purchases with the help of digital aids. And last but not least, the adoption of emerging technologies, which is the topic for this week. A, a few good things to know about emerging technologies is that enterprises are more likely to deploy technologies that they understand and that are more widespread and the ones that have a lot of clear use cases. For labor intensive industries, it's most likely the automation technologies that are heavily invested in. And those industries with complicated supply chains usually experiment with blockchain technologies. And if we look at the emerging technologies, here are a few of them. Notably, we have cybersecurity, we have artificial intelligence, blockchain, IoT, and so on. And these are just some of the technologies that are disrupting the market. And as in any case, we have the innovators, we have the early adopters, we have the mass adopters and late adopters. Technology companies like Google or Facebook, or companies in the aerospace industry, automotive industry, banking, they're all showing trends to be at the forefront of these technology ad adoptions. And of course, the COVID-19 situation is really advancing the adoption in terms of pace, growth, and innovation. There are several, several surveys and reports from global data that have shown that certain specific technologies are at the top of an executive's minds based on the industry. And I'll give a couple of examples. In the case of aerospace, cloud computing and cybersecurity are usually the technologies driving their product development. If you think about the clothing industry, we have artificial intelligence and automation technologies, which are at the top usually. And of course, for finance, Internet of Things and cloud computing, they both play a huge role. So let's take some time to look at a couple of examples and industries and what technologies drive their businesses. So the first one, it, you know, it's the travel industry, which has been struggling a lot because of COVID. And my question for you all is, what is the number one technology that executives in the travel industry are banking on to drive their business? And I will launch a poll for you all to give your best guess. Okay, we have about half of you, just a few more people. Okay, I'm gonna close the poll in five, four, three, two, one. Okay. So it seems that artificial intelligence has the most number of votes um, coming next to 5G and cybersecurity. Well, all right, so I guess the second most popular option is the correct answer according to global data. So according to global data, 5G is the technology where a lot of investments are happening in the travel industry. All right, 
let's move on to the second poll. All right, so let's let's shift gears to the pharmaceutical industry. And again, here are a few technologies, and I want you to select the one that you think is driving this industry and what is most likely on a decision maker's mind. All right, so I'll give you guys about 20 more seconds. All right, we have about half of you in, so feel free to put an option as soon as possible. All right, I'm gonna close it in three, two, one. All right. All right, great. So we have a lot of answers um, in artificial intelligence, and I'm happy to say that that is indeed the correct answer. And as you can see, according to global data, artificial intelligence has by far been the highest impact on the pharmaceutical industry with big data and social media closely following. All right, great answers. It seems like you're getting a hang of this. And let's do one last example. And uh, let me launch the poll. So moving on, what would you say is the driving force behind the sports industry? And again, I'll give you about 20 seconds to put in your guesses. All right, we have about 75% of you. And I'll be closing it in five, four, three, two, one. Okay. It seems that you all have said AI again. Um, and then the next one, next most popular option is 5G. And then you have Internet of Things. And then blockchain. And then cloud computing. All right, so great answers. So the correct answer is actually cloud computing, which surprisingly only two of you or about 4% of you have put. And you know, cloud computing is the number one force behind the sports industry investments. And again, this, this um, survey is based on global data, which is the leading data analytics company for large global industries. So on that note, I hope that gives you some interest for our topic today, which is all about emerging technologies. And let's dive into today's session with our guest speaker who is making these decisions real time every day. So on that note, I am so happy to introduce Pete Hawley, who is an expert executive in the gaming industry. He is a video game product operations executive with 20 years of broad development and publishing experience ranging from the growth of small private companies to his own startup and large public companies. And more than anything, he is an innovator working on gaming projects that are extremely difficult, but really highly rewarding. And he started in the late 90s on PlayStation 1. He worked at companies like Sony, Electronic Arts, and Zynga. And he's now the chief product officer at Mythical Games and the creator of Flankos and NFT Engine. So on that note, I'm so excited to be introducing Pete today. Oh, thank you, Siri. Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, we get to talk about video games for an hour. Um, <clears throat> can you see my screen okay? Yep. All right, cool. So yeah, um, games is fun. Um, I've been doing this oh, 25 years um, it, back in London when I started, um, started on the PlayStation. Um, so in terms of emerging technology, that was a pretty amazing moment in games. Um, a pretty awesome way to have um, 3D graphics in the home for the first time. Um, and I had the pleasure of working at Sony. Um, like I said, the first half of my career was really building AAA games. And, and so games that you more likely see on games that I've made on PlayStation PC, Xbox, and so on. 
And then the second half of my career, really since I landed in the Bay Area, where I lived uh, for nine years, uh, um, I love Berkeley. I used to go to the Greek theater all the time. So I'm pretty familiar with campus and school. Uh, as a Stanford fan, we can avoid the sports conversation today. But, um, you know, I know the area well, and uh, I've spent that half of my career um, building Facebook games at scale and also free to play mobile. So going from AAA into a world driven by enormous audiences and, and data to help derive um, creative concepts and ideas and bringing those two things together at a company like Zynga. So I'm going to do a bit of a brief evolution of what emerging technology used to look like um, back in the day. I'm going to go back 40 years for that part of it real briefly um, when I convinced my parents to buy our first home computer. Uh, and then look at how things are really changing and developing today in uh, some of the platforms and engines that are allowing game communities and people to build their own games. And that's something that, that we're working on too. So it really all, always used to be about you know, the rise of hardware power and, and rendering power. And that was the most exciting thing. And that used to drive marketing and it used to drive lots of excitement. You know, uh, you, you'd see ads on TV that say actual in-game footage, like rendering was the thing. And now things are getting much more interesting as we move to community tools, like cloud computing, AI, and so on. And we'll, we'll talk about what that means and some of what we're seeing in our business for those who well, certainly in my time, you know, I, I was one of maybe three super nerds at school that played video games. Uh, and now I would say pretty much everyone plays video games. Certainly of, you know, the 8 billion or so people on the planet, I think the estimate is about 3 billion. And pretty much the vast majority of, of young people in the United States play video games. So it's been an amazing journey of exponential growth in power, exponential growth in content quality, exponential growth in success, revenue, internet size of audience. Uh, so it's been a, a pretty amazing upward trajectory. Um, so it certainly keeps life interesting. But I think we're about to get into a very exciting future. I think this next decade, and for folks like yourselves who may be interested in video games as a career or just interested generally in it as a business, I think this is a really exciting time to be at college and come out and go into that, that side of the business creatively and think about how emerging technologies can help people make games instead of just submitting a resume to a big publisher and hoping to get in through the door. I think there's some really amazing ways to, to go about that differently. Um, so <clears throat> let's start with the uh, beloved ZX Spectrum on the left, a whole 48K uh, uh, of memory for use for video games. I managed to persuade my parents that we should get one as a family present for Christmas because I was going to use it uh, to do all my homework. Um, turned out that wasn't completely true. Um, my gaming addiction soon took over. Um, but it's a pretty amazing machine for what it was. It sold about 5 million units, I think, mostly in the UK. Um, the next big leap, really, uh, in terms of uh, game content and that wow factor was when the Sony PlayStation 1 arrived in the mid-90s. It really was a big game changer to have... 3D graphics of that quality at the time um, available in a, in a home system, and a home device, which was also a CD-ROM. It was a pretty exciting time. And now we're living in a crazy world and we'll, we'll share some numbers in a minute to, to give you folks um, some context. But with where the PC's gone in the last 10 years, particularly with the insane amount of power and, and what that, the effect that's had on influences and the internet more, more more particularly it's just been amazing to see the rebirth of pc as a real powerhouse and let's not forget mobile the arrival of the iphone and now android has just seen the most amazing exponential growth in gaming game audiences that that we've ever seen and particularly over the last you know five years in particular what we've seen happening in the west and in china has, has it's just been pretty astonishing um and you'll see that some elements of what we just talked about briefly today, the impact of COVID, it, it turns out that one of the uh, positives, certainly for our business and for people who are stuck at home and want to engage with their friends and, and play remotely, uh, it's had a, a pretty positive impact, at least on, on our business. Um, and so for those who understand and know Moore's Law, I, obviously the CEO of NVIDIA would say Moore's Law is dead. Um, and I think there's some real truth in, in that in terms of manufacturing, but at least, you know, for the journey that 
that our business has been on, there were some significant increases in power on the way that, that really allowed us as game makers um, and game creators um, to take advantage of that power in many different ways. With CPU, GPU, RAM speed, hard drive storage, hard drive speed, throughput. I mean, everything was just going exponentially up and up and up and actually trying to make relevant, amazing content on that curve because it can take anything between two, four years more to make a video game. And meantime, the, the whole business is out accelerating the point at which you began. It's been a really interesting and amazing journey. So whether or not we believe in Moore's law being a thing, it's certainly been in our business a, a thing to track in terms of just raw power, horsepower for machines and computing. Well, let's go back to the ZX Spectrum. This, this is where it started for me. Um, uh, 12 years old, completely addicted to a game called Manic Miner, and this was about the pinnacle of, of what we could play at home. Um, you, you have no idea how insanely difficult this level in particular was. <laughs> and this was level one, and there were 12 of these. And so the amount of time and engagement was actually based on just raw difficulty. But, you know, these games were made by single people, individuals in their bedrooms, and were building small businesses for themselves from their homes. And they're, they're sort of project revenues, if you like, were run by them, by, by their mums and dads. And so we, we've gone from, you know, this spot to what the business is today, which I'll talk about in a second. Gran Turismo landed the first time you could have video game fidelity in 3D like this in your house connected to a television. That was quite an amazing moment, I have to tell you, to not have to go to the arcades to experience that anymore was a real thing. And uh, PlayStation really changed the business globally. I mean, Nintendo had done that previously with amazing games on cartridges and console, but it was really the birth of 3D in the home with the PlayStation that really changed the game. And that was the, uh, the starting place um, for my career. But if you fast forward to today, um, there's a shot from Red Dead Redemption in 4K on a PC, the, the, the changes in emerging technologies just in terms of rendering power has just been amazing to, to see and it's one of the things that keeps me so engaged in this business is because it just doesn't stand still i mean whether it's you know this image the reflections in the water down to the veins in the horse's leg i mean for where it's gone over the last 10 years alone has just been hard to follow but come coming with that is a is a size and scale scope and scale of development and size of team and required effort and cost that's just really quite astonishing. And then on the other side, we're starting to see some really interesting things emerge um, in how people are coming together and creating their own games. And that's some of what I see as emerging technology, and it's happening already. We'll talk through some examples of that too. I'm going to take a brief pause for any questions. So I keep to my promise of not sitting here and just talking at you all uh, for a long period of time. So I don't know what the format is for asking questions, but if anybody's got any now before I go into our business overall and then on to the next phase, then let me know. Is there a way to raise a hand or chat or something? Yeah, if anyone has any questions, feel free to unmute or type it in the chat. I'll wait a polite amount of time. <laughs> right. So, oh, sorry. Yeah, go I was going to ask. So you said that you worked on AAA games like in early in your career. Yeah. What titles did you work on? I'm very curious. Oh yeah, I'm going to come to that actually. So during um during this talk, I'm going to I'm going to do a few interludes, if you like, with some career snapshots. And really that's about the games I've made and the, the amazing teams that I've worked with. And uh, so I, I'm gonna talk about some of why I chose those games and why what those games represented at the time were, were because of some emerging technologies at that point in time. So um, I was at EA. So to keep it brief, I was the executive producer on Burnout Paradise and Need for Speed and that driving side of the business. I, I was in a, in a career of making driving games for quite some time. And then uh, decided I was gonna try something a little different, but I was really um, engaged deeply in um, my time at Sony working on driving games and then at EA. So, and I'm gonna talk about some of those as we go. 
Thank you. All right, so we'll, we'll move along. This is our business today. I love this image because, you know, I'm a very visual learner. Certainly when I was at school and even now when we're talking about creative concepts and ideas or roadmaps, we have to sketch and draw, I have to see things. And obviously we live in a world of data and I can stare at a spreadsheet and a model all day. That's a critical part of the job, particularly now. But this is quite an amazing image. Not only does it show growth in, in revenue, which is certainly one measure, it shows what grew and where over which time and really what projects, games and releases were a big driver of those things. So obviously back in my day, you've got to go all the way over to the left, I'm afraid. Uh, I, I remember Pac-Man being an absolute obsession of mine and it was really appealing to really a broad audience when it came out. It's just such a wonderful game. And then from there, the rest speaks for itself, really. Doom was an, a big deal. It certainly, actually Doom is the, how I got my job in the video games industry. I, I, I started working on um, PC magazines, print magazines back in the day. And um, I reviewed a copy of Doom that I downloaded off ftp.idsoftware.com and no one else knew how to get hold of it. So I got hold of it and reviewed it. And because no one else had ever heard of it, I got the job. So Doom has a special place in my heart. And then you can see that exponential growth when when mobile arrives, obviously, you know, um, the the feature phones um, were a big deal, particularly in Japan, and, and then here in the West, but then we're obviously with the birth of, of iPhone in terms of quality, and then an Android's just been amazing to see. And there's some other pieces coming through, you know, VR, AR, but really, the, the dominance there is still PC, which is great to see console business and those things are coming pretty close together you know in terms of hardware specifications and content very little discernible difference other than uh controllers and you know exclusive content uh and mobile is still the driving force and particularly what we see with companies like tencent uh, uh billy billy and others in china it's been amazing to see and that just breaks it down a little further uh for 2020 and i and i think this was you know, wrapping up 2020 and, and, you know, talking a little again about COVID, the COVID, COVID impact on games and even game platforms like Roblox, just seen enormous exponential month to month growth during 2020. And I, obviously, as a game maker and a father, I would hope that that's not coming at the cost of uh, spending time in school and education, but um, gaming is certainly a, a real thing at this point. And, uh, continues to grow unabated. Uh, and I think what's coming next with the next wave of players and game communities and creators, uh, we're, we're gonna see, um, you know, still more. So, so let's do my first career snapshot. Um, and why I made these things, why I spent uh, multiple hours, days, years of my life building these things. Um, Driver was the first significant release uh, and the team that I worked with were amazing. I was the producer on this game. I learned my craft on this game because it's so ludicrously difficult. It was essentially a game built on PC and then signed by Sony. And so we then had to basically squeeze it into that two mega memory. And we only could stream an open world from a single speed CD-ROM, which was certainly one of the most painful things um, that we could have done whilst also making the game insanely fun. Um, the game was a big hit, number one in the US and Europe. Um, I have very fond memories and a lot of lifelong friends from that project. Um, from there, black and white, really the emerging technology here was how we could use AI. And honestly, these amazing Cambridge computer science graduates uh, to drive uh, artificial intelligence in world creation and interaction. Um, it was a uh, hilarious to make because a lot of what happened just emerged in gameplay and some of that was uncontrollable and led to some pretty embarrassing early demos of the game it has to be said because if you build intelligent creatures that are prone to picking people up and eating them randomly when they're hungry there's all manner of chaos would break out and that was the wonderful thing about that game and there's a an interesting full circle moment uh, for that story in terms of some of the systems that we see today and some of the people on that team and what they went on to do. We're gonna come back and talk about it at the end because it's pretty amazing. And, and then when I was at Sony PlayStation, I used to fund development and some of my friends from Lionhead, um, they left the company and formed Media Molecule and 
you know, we built the prototype together and I funded that team to create what became Little Big Planet um, on the basis that what would happen if instead of investing all of our time and energy and effort as a development team into uh, just making, you know, player experiences in a, in a sort of linear or multiplayer fashion, what would happen if we built tools and handed those over to the community so they could build their own levels and then share them amongst themselves on the basis that um, on mass that community of highly engaged players who love the game would have better ideas i mean more people will have more ideas and some of those ideas will be better and so why would a team of you know 50 people come up with all the best ideas and, it, and it's part of that democratization of of design uh, which we're starting to see more of now yeah. so that was my life in the in the 2000s uh, back in england um, and then moving on um, really to the emerging technologies and the reason that I was asked to choose a topic and I was happy to choose this one because I think we're going through a transformational shift in the games business and, and in many, many ways and I'm going to try and capture some of the interesting ideas today but um, who knows where it'll end up but there's so much happening and so much changing and so much of that in the hands of players and communities, things are starting to change radically with new tools and platforms. And all, all of this really is because of player behavior. Um, and so it's really interesting that it's not just big companies that are going to make games of the future. It's actually people like us as professionals or as game makers and, and game lovers. And so I, I was just thinking about this, but what does that actually mean? in terms of these emerging technologies, what, what has been the point of, of these changes and what's driven that? Well, obviously it's always and should be audience and player behavior. I mean, that, that's, that's really what I've seen happening. And, you know, gamers used to be like myself back in the day, go to a shop, $40 in your pocket, pick up a hit off the shelf, take it home, play it. Like I was a consumer of games and then the internet came along and made me a connected consumer of games. But really back in the day when I was a games journalist, you know, I used to review games for a living. It's kind of funny for you folks if you look at YouTube and influencers and the people who review games and have millions of followers and, and live, live viewers. The idea of some guy in London playing a game for a week and then giving it 7 out of 10 seems like a pretty terrible idea at this point. So the, that was really democratized by the internet, like YouTube, Twitch, social media and those influencers, who cares? Because if en masse, you can figure out for yourself your own tastes and your own communities and your own games, and your own things that you like, you'll decide where you spend your time and money and won't be dictated to by individual reviews and so on. So that, that really is through the media heavily disrupted and democratized by the audience. And then during the last 10 years, 2010s, the free to play model change things again because now we're looking at where you want to spend your time you know the the the, the barrier to entry isn't necessarily 60 bucks the barrier to entry is whether or not the game's good enough and uh, you feel that you have the time to engage and play in that game and, and if and when you want to spend money it really democratized the idea that you don't have to buy the uh, video game sequel for 60 dollars once a year it, it, this is something now that, that you can figure out for yourself. These, most of these games are, are, are at scale are free. Uh, you know, whether that be some of the big hits that came out of China and Korea in the first instance, or even today with games like Warzone from Activision, you know, there are free to play versions of the majority of big hits. So now democratization is about the, the, the thing that I do as a game maker and the teams that, that I've worked with, we're seeing a real shift in well, who gets to say what gets made and how does that happen? So it's, it's really now, I think, the democratization of development, the idea that creation, economics and ownership is going to be in the hands of players and communities much, much more than it ever has been. And you're seeing it already with some of the obvious examples like Roblox, and we'll, we'll talk about that specifically. But I think we're getting into a really exciting moment here where game assets are things that you could own and you can use your own market intelligence and data to look at the things that you've made and the things that you're selling and build your own business and then how do the things you make get discovered i think there's going to be new and amazing ways to do that that are quite disruptive um, to the way things are done today and it's really exciting 
I can pause actually if anyone has any questions again. I can take a sip of water. So you had the, uh, the graph earlier of um, the revenue produced by games that were like based on different technologies. Uh, I saw near the end there was one for like cloud technology. I don't really know mm. an example of, of that. Yeah, that's a, great, that's a great question. So it's, you, you can use that word in many different ways, right? Because obviously anything that needs to operate at scale in a free to play business like Warzone, right? Operates in the cloud, it has to, right? I mean, data storage, you know, multiplayer services and connectivity, like basically everything. And, and more and more, a lot of computation on, on the heavy side for mobile games happens in the cloud and the, the client is not, it's not a dumb client, but it, it's reliant on that cloud. So I think in that reference to that, to that chart in particular, it's probably relatable to, you know, what Google Stadia was trying to do and others where it's literally cloud based rendering and, and the power to push content because we all use cloud services. But I think that was particularly the, one of the reasons it was so small is because, is because it's really a, an, an attempt to change the way games are broadcast, streamed and distributed. I think that's what that reference was. That makes sense. Thank you. We have a question from Artem in the chat um, and it's a really fun one. And he's asking, what is your favorite game of all time? Is it one of those first simple games or the modern impressive ones with cool graphics and so on? Yeah, I get, I get asked this one a lot. Um, and I like to stay in games that are new. So, you know, right now, if you ask me, it's, a, it's an interesting question because there are, there are classics that people like to associate with, right? And so you might say Zelda or um, and I actually think the interesting way to look at it again, because of data is, well, actually, if that's your first instinct, then obviously that that's a good instinct and it's probably true. But if you think about it slightly differently, what, what is the game you spent the most time in? It might not be the game you came up with as your favorite, but there surely has to be a correlation between time spent and favorite. Um, so for me, I would say early days, time spent and just the most raw fun I've ever had, I think, with friends was an old, an old arcade game called Gauntlet. It was the true first social game in that the four of you were essentially a Dungeons and Dragons team that were making your way through the most insane set of dungeons that you've ever come across. And it was insanely difficult because most people have these sort of, you know, rose tinted glasses about arcade games but the, the reason they were so brutally difficult is when you died you had to put money in the machine so it's like, it was actually quite ruthless and then the people who own the arcades could go in the back and adjust all the difficulty curves so the kids have to throw more money in so like you know it was a pretty ruthless business but gauntlet was amazing it was highly social four of you stood around a machine together a wizard a fighter and so on and, and a thief and a and an archer and you would, you would fight across the dungeon and there were certain things you could get for each other to to you know help yourself through the journey and if the for example if the warrior picked up a potion it was useless and so your buddy would like punch you in the arm and it was amazing it was about the, as much fun as you could have as a as a teenager in an arcade and then fast forward to today um, time spent for me is split even evenly between you know destiny 2 uh, from bungie and warzone which is up until recently debatable, um, a pretty astonishing piece of software. And uh, those two really stand out to me at the beginning of my gaming addiction and, and where I sit today. So. Obviously getting older doesn't make Warzone any easier, I can tell you. So, uh, you know, you, can, <laughs> you should get in there now, get in while you can. And we have one last question from yeah. Ian, so go for it. Hi, Pete. Um, I kind of have two questions since you're like a game developer with a lot of experience, right? So I think like the, the pandemic, like since everyone is at lockdown, they're at home, they have a lot of time to play games. And then we can see that from the scalping, you know, the GPU price hike and the, you know, the, mm. what is it called? The, the shortage basically. And do you think that after we get back to normal, I don't know when, you know, um, do you think that we, there'll be a drop in like games, gameplay, you know, not gameplay, like people playing games. You know, and how will that affect? 
Sorry. You know, the, the, yeah, the, there's part of me that wants to say, I hope so. Uh, because as a racing cyclist and a mountaineer, I ain't going to be playing Warzone as much as I am. Um, and I, I really do hope people get out and, and do more. But I don't think it's going to change things in a significant way. Just because gaming is entertainment. It's largely been recession proof. Um, who knows what's going to happen when things get back to normal for us, maybe in the spring or sorry, in the summer or fall this year and beyond. Um, I think it may drop somewhat, but you know, in games generally when, when audiences grow and they discover friends socially and people do spend more time online, they do represent themselves more online often than they do in real life in some, some cases. I can imagine that they will stick. So we may see maybe some slow, some slowness in that curve, but these audiences are super sticky and they just love the games that they find and they stick around for long periods of time. And, and that that's true by any metric that you track it. So, um, and then obviously with the supply chain questions on, on, on all of that, you know, the GPU is a scarce resource. It's in Xboxes, it's in Playstations, it's in fridges, it's in PCs, it's used to, you know, controversially in some ways, um, mine currencies, it's used for all manner of things. And so I just don't think an amazing, even an amazing company like Nvidia can keep up, honestly, it's, it's insane. So hopefully we'll all be able to buy a new Nvidia card and a PlayStation at some point, because that is a potential problem for the for the first parties you know if you're spending half a billion dollars making a game you better have some installed hardware for it and the slower the pace of that install the less chance you have of your game being as hugely successful as you wanted it to be so i think that's a challenge for the platform holders but we shall see all right Thank you. we have a couple more questions one from yeah. Kenza, so go ahead Kenza. thank you um, yeah, my question is, uh, what's um, what's the game that um, you learned from most, like work-wise? Oh, that's that's good. I would say um, two, and again, start of career because what did I know? Um, I was so ambitious and enthusiastic about working in video games that, that I volunteered to make that game I mentioned, Driver. And I wasn't really qualified to do that, but I was so annoying to my boss that he just let me, he gave it to me in the end. And so I was learning on the job, really. Um, and the things that I learned, I still carry with me today. And, and really the number one takeaway for me was as a product creator, as a game creator, you can't do anything without engineers. It's impossible. And we hit so many fundamental technical snags in that game. There was no path to it being finished and finished well or, or to any level of quality. And I figured out very early on in my career that actually sitting down late at night with the best engineers in the building was actually what got us through across the line. And so even today, if anyone has a question about when things are going to happen or when things are going to be good, I go to engineering. So that, that stood me in good stead. The other one, another driving game was Burnout because, you know, again, I'll, I'll talk about that one a little later. It, it was so complex in so many different ways. It was 150 square miles of open world and the player could go anywhere but race to a final destination. And so you had to inset, intersect uh, traffic AI systems and players coming together at crossroads and merging traffic systems at 60 frames a second. And looking back, it was one of the craziest things we tried to do and deeply, deeply complex in terms of traffic movement and AI, just because we found out it didn't deal with bridges and cars passing underneath. And so they'd invisibly collide and then traffic systems wouldn't merge. So you'd see different cars than I saw and then I crashed and you didn't. And, going back through some development hell there for a second. But um, I learned a lot from that too, because coming away from that exercise really was about doing less better. You know, the, the, the only way to be successful with that game was to just take on less, but establish what was 
really different about the game and just go super deep on those things and fix those because it would have been easy to just keep building events and more cars and more everything. But actually, we had to identify what was really special about the game and put all of our energy into that um, for it to even stand a chance of being completed on time, which EA made abundantly clear to me <laughs> that was very important. So. Thank you. So can I say that was your least favorite game? Least? Uh, oh. Okay, you don't have to. Oh, yeah. I, I worked on, I was the executive producer on the Athens 2004 Olympics game, where I had to regularly fly to Athens and show all of the in game renders to the International Olympics Committee for them to sign off on all the advertising and all the color swatches, arena designs, grass color, uh, athlete bibs, sponsor logos. It was hell. I also had to demonstrate how you could use a dance mat to sprint 100 meters in the game, which was one of the most embarrassing things I had to do. So I just had a load of like 75 year old men at the IOC in Switzerland, just just looking at me like, what is this idiot doing? So it, the game was great. It was a, it was a success. But in terms of the process, not much fun. Thank you so much for the answer. Yeah, of course. All right, we have two more questions, uh, Santiago and then Villian. Hi, okay, so my question is uh, regarding Warzone. You said that you play Warzone and with you being a game developer, I'm sure you've heard about skill-based matchmaking. Mm. And it is a thing, it, 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 it's a big debate among people among the community right now. And I don't think it's been quite, I mean, understood how it actually works, what parameters, what, what things they actually look at. So I was just wondering if you had any idea how it's actually um, being ran and, and, and what goes behind it and the, I guess the financial incentive behind it and stuff. Yeah, well, interestingly, and I can't, I can't speak for, the, for Activision or the developer. I know it's made by Raven Software and Infinity Ward, and essentially a giant collective at this point. I, and I can't speak for them, but generally speaking, in large companies, it's actually hard um, to go back and fix the fundamental systems that you built, because compared to all the other things that you have to do and release on an annual basis, on a shared technology around matchmaking and skill-based matching, um, hard to say, well, let's sort of take this aside and innovate and then plug it back in. And there's no warning signals, right, in terms of But I do have Hey, Pete, we're having technical difficulties, at least on my end. Um, yeah, that's also on my. There's all different ways of min max that those systems. And I, and I think uh, over time, we need to be more play behaviors and play tests raw skills to define who gets matched with who based on what kind of experience they're looking for. Um, I certainly don't want to be thrown into a match of highly competitive teenagers because I know how that ends. <laughs> I would much rather be put in, you know, in a group of uh, like-minded people who are there to have time of their lives and a lot of fun. And so that's very hard to do on pure level and pure skills, however you account for skill. Um, but I think if you get into the to taste and play style, and more of how Netflix judges things like, well, these people had much more fun in, in this level because it was more engaging. And so they need to think about what that metric would look like. And this was more engaging and fun for this group of players because they discovered each other here and played in this way, in this style. So once you get away from just pure skill based matchmaking on an ELO rating or otherwise uh, and into how people play and who they like to play with and how to interpret that 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 experience, whether it's be through machine learning over a period or whether that's through, you know, having the right things to adjust and play with, that system needs to get better because it just feels horribly broken on occasions and can actually have pretty lasting impacts on communities that really start to get fed up with how the system currently works. And, and that's why players, as we call it in the business, that's 
often why players start to churn and leave. You know, and so they're important things to consider, right? Because again, for Call of Duty with a new battlefield coming this year, and some of the imbalances in, in the weapons that they're currently having to deal with or not deal with, um, you know, those things are problematic because the, the switching costs are fairly straightforward. You, you can jump into battlefield with your friends quite easily using the Xbox or otherwise. So uh, it's really important, but um, hard to innovate at big companies. That is a giant ship to try and steer or move. And uh, some of those foundational systems and legacy code could go back 20 years. Game engine, multiplayer code, hard to go back in and rewire. All right. Yeah, we, we were having some technical difficulties, Pete, <laughs> but we were able to catch what you were saying at the end. Um, oh, okay. I'm sorry. Yes. And uh, William, do you have a question? Yeah, last question. I think you're going to address this after this slide, but it's about like graphic quality. Nowadays, we have, let's talk about DLSS, where you, you know, it's RTX specific and then you get really good quality games. But in the future, you know, if we keep on just having that, and you know, good quality, everything's going to be a really real life looking. Like, what would be the new, um, the new breakthrough is it the immersiveness of the you know like let's talk about vr game like how do you see the future of gaming like i think that's a really broad question but yeah yeah um i, I see it you know obviously some people think it looks like ready player one um mm -hmm. and some people often describe it as the metaverse and you will see games companies pitching their platforms and ideas as as being the next or the the formative metaverse and you know buzzwords are a thing in our industry I, I would argue the only real existent metaverse at this point is a game called leave online which is just an astonishing experience for anyone not easy to get into but it's really a, a, a secondary existence um, in the realist sense socially economically politically um, so VR, if you look on the chart of growth, is really failing to hit its scale, right? Generally speaking, so sweeping generalization, but it's not really hitting the scale of the other businesses that you can see despite being around for quite a number of years at this point. Um, and the metaverse is obviously in many ways less to do with rendering because Minecraft changed that perception forever. And uh, we're seeing it now in Roblox. Because if, again, if you go back to a metric of time spent, there's nothing close in what, what, how you would describe gaming. So I think at some point, if there's a highly engaging platform that players are defining for themselves and it's rendered a high quality, however that's visualized, you know, that's going to be a pretty amazing thing. And it could be VR if many of the challenges on hardware and, and so on are solved. But um, Games are so immersive. I mean, you know, if you play a great game, you're immersed. You know, I don't generally look around the room very much when I'm playing games. I'm, I'm in, and so I think the recent spread of ultra wide curved screens and great audio and headphones and, and ways to socialize, they're very magical experiences at this point in history, and they're hard to break into. Oh, you should wear this. I kind of like this freedom and this space to look around this giant screen. So, but it's, it's, it's things like, and platforms like Roblox that are really going to supercharge where our business goes because their numbers are astonishing. And I'm going to share some of them that are public information. It'll give you, you folks with aspirations or otherwise to see like where that, where that power of content creation is going to come from. It's pretty amazing to see. It's why actually Netflix, reference Roblox and Fortnite as their biggest competitors, because in the end, it's about time spent, right? That That's, if you measure engagement in time spent, like in the billions of hours, you know, that that's a fascinating uh, comparison for, for media companies against games. All right, shall I move along? Because someone needs to keep me, uh, like any great producer on a game needs to keep me on time. <laughs> so I'll keep rolling. Um, so yeah, democratization, uh, we talked a lot about that as we, and I'm not gonna repeat myself because it's some of what I was 
getting to we just talked about which is awesome there were great questions um and I, I think a lot of what we're seeing is more fundamental than um where we've been in hardware and rendering and you know to me it's a bit like a movie you know cgi is cgi but after a while it's the human story and the same with games you know rendering is rendering what's what's the social connected tissue of this game that makes it really powerful and interesting to me and again minecraft is the standout for me in the last decade for that you know my kids played eight years ago and recently went back to the server with their friends and it was like going back to our, like you know elementary school with their friends it was, they're all hanging out in this world they built eight years ago it was amazing to watch that sort of how emotional they were to go back to this place that they built together and i think that persistence is pretty amazing um and things are getting more sophisticated. Uh, the tools that are being used, the ways in which game makers, game players uh, are, are connecting socially, those communication tools, they're really key because most people show up in games to, to make friends, find friends and, and play together. It's so important to the stickiness and engagement of a contemporary mobile PC or console game. Even when they're all yelling, shouting, screaming, and swearing at each other, it can uh, as long as you can turn that off, we're good. Because I can assure you that is a significant part of our business is monitoring, tracking, and deleting much of that. Um, one of the challenges of user-generated content. So let, let's look at a few. Um, Minecraft was the big game changer here. Um, the creation generation. This this isn't about oh. You guys made a game cool here's 60 dollars. thank you very much this this is the new technology emerging because of player behavior and demand and so that that, that group of kids that played minecraft eight years ago then develop more sophisticated concepts simulations and gameplay in roblox and some good friends of mine from zynga uh, have built a system called core to take the rendering quality to another level. We're very similar. Build your own game experience is pretty amazing. Um, and then and what we're building with Blanco is very similar, based on collectible, shareable, sellable NFTs as characters that have unique value and utility in gameplay, but also an ability to create, make your own games, game experiences, and invite your friends in to, to play and hang out. Just hang out and listen to music. You don't have to be there to compete. So we're seeing games as being a space to come and, and be with friends whether you're competing playing or just hanging around and doing the stuff you do in, in regular life you know post covid but um it's pretty amazing and these things collectively however it transforms into like a path to the metaverse which you know something of a buzzword but you know we've all seen ready player one and it is um, a pretty amazing thing to think you could show up be anything in any game with any people and experience any experience you want to experience and, and get away from the drudgery of life, which is really in that movie an extreme, but really that's what video games were for me. You know, I was brought up in the industrial North of England. It wasn't the brightest place to uh, spend your childhood. Uh, and, you know, games were like this amazing, colorful fantasy escape uh, for me. And now the internet makes that even more compelling, obviously. And I'm just gonna recommend uh, not necessarily playing EVE Online, um, although I do know some folks there and the founder. Um, it's an amazing experience. If you can't play it or you don't want to play it, I recommend this book on the right just to understand um, game behavior and communities at scale. This, this game's 18 years in. Very, very sophisticated economy essentially runs like Wall Street, this book is amazing. It talks through some of the great conflicts in EVE Online. So as it says, Empires of EVE, History of the Great Wars of EVE Online. And I was chatting to someone at CCP last week, the guys who make it out there in Iceland, and they, they had a person who uh, gamed the system on playing the margin game on their commodity markets in the game, created fake accounts and played the margins and essentially gamed the system for a, a trillion uh, in-game dollars or ISK, and with that trillion funded a war, uh, which at a zero sum level wiped out hundreds of thousands of dollars of, of ships in, in combat. So there's something happening in that game that I believe is absolutely unique and magical. And um, 
it's a, an amazing thing to study. I, even if you're studying psychology, it's like the things you can get away with in a game that you couldn't get away with in real life. Um, pretty amazing. And this, this book is sometimes hard to find, but a really amazing read, uh, which will tell you more about where games are headed, I think, than, than most. So we're going to do another brief snapshot here. Uh, <clears throat> talked about Burnout Paradise. Um, the, one of the most rewarding games I've made. Uh, just rendering 150 square miles at 60 frames a second in a highly complex world of multiplayer chaos. Where it turns out, you know, it was the first time we used data in a console game because we used to just ship things in boxes. And, and I, I, myself and the team went down to PC World and we bought, we bought a PC and we hired a guy out of IT to build what we didn't know at the time was a SQL database. And we burned some code onto the disk and shipped it and then suddenly started to receive data on what our players were actually doing in the game. We'd never done that before. It was a real first. And um, from that data, we learned more about the habits of our players and then changed our roadmap to suit. And it turned out that all those multiplayer events and these amazing things that we thought were really cool uh, like 96% of players didn't touch them. They just wanted to hang out in cars and smash things up. And so our roadmap then developed into just, okay, well, let's turn the whole world into a skate park for cars, like jumping off cliffs and doing loops and smashing into each other for points and transform the game. Um, during my time in Silicon Valley, I started my own company called Red Robot. Uh, back in 2011, we shipped a game called Life is Crime, which was a location-based game, and <clears throat> a good two years before Pokemon Go. So timing wasn't quite right, and uh, Pokemon is an amazing phenomenon, but we, we had a great time building that game. That We decided it would be a really good idea to render the entire planet and customise it, and so wherever you stood on the face of the planet, it would render your surroundings in a video game sense, and we chose crime as a theme so you could take over your neighborhood and take over your local coffee shop and fight with your neighbors and friends and it was popular on college and business campuses um, and we had a lot of fun making that game despite the ridiculous complexity of the capturing the vertices of every street on the planet and cleaning that data up into an api and rendering it in unity so <laughs> i'm not really want to go back to those uh, six months of our lives but we, we learned so much uh, and again pointing back to the need for engineers. And um, and then at Zynga, just going from a console game that would sell, you know, anything between two, 10, 15 million copies and some extraordinary numbers now for, for the likes of Grand Theft Auto, but going from, you know, millions of copies sold, you know, obviously for a lot of money, um, to then go to a company that was servicing hundreds of millions of players globally across Facebook games, which was a ridiculous phenomenon for Farmville and Cityville in particular. Um, and then on, on to mobile, I learned so much there about what it means to drive design by data and operate games at scale in terms of infrastructure, cloud infrastructure and distribution and discovery of mobile games. Um, pretty amazing time to, to be at that company and I learned so much. and. Met a lot of really good friends there in the Bay Area that I still speak with and occasionally hire. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to read these out. These are just some of where emerging technologies are starting to develop because of player behavior and some of how those things are being utilized. Essentially what this means with these new platforms like Roblox and Blancos and Core if you have an idea, you can make it quickly. You don't need a large team. You don't need to be particularly skilled in um, <clears throat> computer science and engineering. Some scripting for simulation is cool, but for the most part, these tools are there to allow you to create these amazing worlds, these amazing gameplay experiences and these great social experiences without a large team or necessarily deep engineering knowledge and also giving you access to a shared community volume of assets and, 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 and things to help you build these worlds. So you're not having to have a giant art team or have an enormous budget. There are ways to create things that you can feel and see in your head and you've talked with friends and have great ideas and get to them really quickly. And then behind the scenes, real amazing developments in AI, machine learning, whether that's for in-game systems. And we, we talked a little about player matching and, and how important that's gonna be in the future certainly at higher scale, 
to multiplayer prediction models. So AI generally knows how humans play. And so, you know, the internet's not great at exchanging information and, and quality packets of data for gameplay for the most part. The internet was not designed for games. Um, and so there's, there's ways in, in AI to improve um, those experiences by client server prediction modeling and, and predicting player movement to pre improve accuracy. There's just some amazing things happening. And, and then machine learning, obviously early days, because neither of these systems have a point of view. You know, they don't know what good looks like, but the rule systems are allowing us to take enormous shortcuts in how things are developed. And then now in the world of really open economics and the world that I'm living in currently, the NFT engine for gaming and, and how we're realizing that in Blanco is the ability to give players ownership over their assets and characters and, and, and in-game items for the first time and then invest time and energy and effort into upgrading those things and making them scarce and rare, not just from an uh, artistic perspective, but an in-game utility perspective. And then if after time they want to sell those things on, on our secondary market, they can do that for real money. And if they've done that with friends, you can split that money. And suddenly there's a way to make a living in games, uh, which has never really been there before, at least legitimately, also allows us to legitimize gray markets where people made tens of millions of dollars farming gold for World of Warcraft. Well, now we can empower these communities and give them the tools to, to build their own businesses around games, um, not just in them. Often auction houses and things built in games by developers have failed because it's one model and one set of ideas. Whereas if it's if it's in the hands of the community and in the hands of the audience, they can define for themselves what value is and what something's worth. Um, so it's really fascinating. Um, and it's the early days, lots of challenges with that technology. Uh, it was super exciting and uh, certainly keeps my weeks interesting, that's for sure. Um, so we've got these amazing in-engine tools and you do that with friends. You can do that with the communities that exist around, you know, things like Core and Roblox. You can come together in Blancos and cooperatively build these experiences. So you're not coming in to shoot each other. You're not coming in to race against each other. You're just coming in to build together and learn together. Um, some of what was done in Minecraft and now taking that to really a visual rendering perspective that's of a higher quality. And, focusing on that social experience between people. And then if there's a game system, that's great. If it's just there to listen to music and dance and hang out, that's cool too. And you, you saw that even with, uh, you know, what um, Fortnite did with Travis Scott, you know, that stuff works and, and people show up, they're looking for alternative spaces to be entertained, right? With their friends. And if you can't all get on a plane, go to an arena and, you know, go and see uh, Kendrick Lamar or Tame Impala, then, you know, you can just you can do it online in your favorite game and do it all at the same time. And there's some really interesting developments coming along there uh, that, are, that, are, that are really changing things, um, which is pretty cool. Rules or no rules. And then those marketplaces in those spaces that you've created to say, well, here's this place I made and here are my friends and here's my music and here's some things that we made and you guys might find them useful. You can buy them and then the, you, you get these in-game marketplaces and developments around in-game entrepreneurs really and revenue sharing for the creators of those assets and also the platform that enabled that right whether that's us or roblox or core there's, a, there's an enablement of those things and then a, and a sharing of the profit which again is moving away from games as consumption here's 60 dollars. thank you and by the way that was a sub license you don't actually own that thing you bought you just sub licensed it really changing what it means to own own things and what it means for those things to be worth money. So I asked for permission this morning from Frederick, who's the CEO over at Core, to share an image from his platform. You know, this is a, a game, a pretty successful shooter, um, akin to Fortnite about Royale, but very, very simple to make. And everything you see here is a, an asset or a model from their library and compiled into a new game experience by their community. And this is a good shot, but this one's spectacular uh examples of what players are doing and and this is a level that that a member of our team made in blancos this morning this this took less than two hours because all of the assets that you need to just create something are right there in front of you, you just lay it out play it and publish it and when it's published 
everyone in the community can jump in and find it and play together and experience what you've made. And people love that reciprocal, I made something and people showed up to play in it. This is really cool. And, and you start to get that reciprocal feeling of creators and, and, and players together. Um, and we've seen some amazing things happen. So early days for us, but it's been pretty awesome. And let's talk about Roblox for a second coming back to the magical engagement number of time spent, uh, like 3 billion hours. It's pretty insane. Um, I, I can't actually compute that in my head in terms of, I think we have 200 million people on the platform. Um, and some of the games are amazing. These have all been built by the community and there, there are teams forming now in Roblox that are making a, a substantial living for themselves. There are, teams coming together and raising money from traditional methods like a VC to build teams that make Roblox games. So to give you some idea of the size and success of that platform. And I, I know Dave, who's the CEO, you know, who would describe it as a overnight success that took 15 years. Um, it's been around a long time and, and you can see the growth that they had in 2020 in particular was, was crazy. Um, but outside of the time spent, the most amazing fact that stood out to me was that three quarters of American nine to 12 year olds play its games. I was like, okay, that is an army of creators coming with an expectation of, all right, what should we do now? Um, Cause you know, as you get older, you might want to uh, of not want to run around avoiding a giant murderous pig called Piggy. I mean, you know, sounds like fun, but what else would you want to do that's maybe more sophisticated? I don't know, Roblox are taking that avenue and path too to allow for more sophistication. So that army of, of nine to 12 year olds, when, when a bit like the Minecraft generation, when they grow to an age of wanting to build their own games because, hey, that's how we do this. <laughs> this is how this works. Thank you very much, you know, to the traditional publishers. It's a pretty amazing transformation, I think, over the next decade, and, and some of these numbers are crazy. So if you see this pig run, um, like billions of kids, the number one game on, on the platform. I can pause for more questions before we dig into how people might make a living from this. I do need to pause for water. Yeah, I have a question, actually. Um, would you say that blockchain technology is very fundamental to Mythical Games' uh, business model? Yes, it certainly is. Uh, it has been for two years. Um, and really, again, it's, it's really easy at the moment to live in a world of buzzwords, right? And even with the NFT bubble, some describe it as a bubble, for certainly on the outside, you know, to get excited about those things in the moment. But actually, the reason we chose that technology is because it, it solves for a real problem that, that players have, which is a huge demand to build their own marketplaces based on their efforts, to realize the value and the things that they use in games as museum pieces. You know, that's how we talk about game assets and items. They're, they're really valuable outside of the art. Um, the utility of those things, the history of that item, the one sword, the one gun, the one anything, that is the NFT. You know, we spend most of our time explaining fungible, non-fungible. It's really boring for the most part, but it's really, it was well described on a podcast recently that if there were 10 $10 bills and one of them was yours, you don't care which one you take off the table, you've still got $10 and it's divisible by 10 ones, 40 quarters. It's it's fungible, it's money. And then there's a car and it's a Ferrari. So there's one of them, right? And, and it's really unique and special. And you can't take that apart and break it up into pieces. It's, it's, it's a unique, scarce, rare item of enormous value. So you transfer that to digital and put that into the game world. Um, that's how we think about it. We think about it as a technology that solves for a real creative problem and player demand around marketplaces. And even if we were to legitimize gray markets, I think that's a significant step to helping communities um, um, 
you know, profit from their efforts and then uh, create the connection between entrepreneurs and, and collectors and speculators and how people play and bring those together. And it's like, it's pretty powerful. And so it is fundamental and it comes with some challenges. Uh, it can be slow. Uh, th there's a huge discussion going on currently uh, around the environmental impact, environmental impact of, of cryptocurrency and minting of NFTs. And I think that's a problem we took very seriously from the outset. And I think we, we have an approach to that that's very different from others. Uh, and we're taking a very strategic curated approach that um, I think is going to pay off for us and, and the people and the partners that we're working with. So it's, it's very fundamental to us, yeah. Yeah, I have a quick follow up question. So if blockchain did not exist, could you have built the products and have the same business model with the centralized system of record? Uh, you could, yeah. And we joke about that often, you know, don't have a private chain because that's just a server. It's like, you know, what's the point? And um, in, in terms of long term success, again, you go back to EVE Online, you know, we were talking to those guys and we were just laughing together because again we're not we're not, we're not drinking any kool-aid here because they, they've had a pretty significant database and back end that's been going for 18 years and the players are very happy with it right so what the, the difference here is what happens when you extract those items outside of that walled garden onto a more open market that, that's super fascinating and interesting and with the smart contract and the distribution of revenue uh, that that's a model of enormous interest in terms of being able to track those things, but also have a source of truth. So you're going to try, we're trying to find that balance between a private marketplace and then what we would call an on off ramp to Ethereum mainnet, right? So you have the choice to do that, but we're not just, you know, taking all of our assets and minting everything and then just putting it on mainnet and then hoping for the best. Because as we often said at Zing, you know, hope is a losing strategy. So we're pretty happy with our approach. I don't think we could do what we're doing in marketplaces without it. No, I don't, I don't, I don't, I mean, we could, but we might as well just make a, you know, a successful game and, and then build a market in a very different way. I think this is a more open distributed way of doing it and giving players ownership of, of those assets and items and being able to make real money from them, which you can't do in any game walled garden because the business is there as the business uh, happens on those platforms. And there's some challenges to that, obviously. What happens if, you know, a end game is not around anymore? How is it true ownership if there's no way for that NFT token to point to an asset anymore? Because it doesn't exist. And there's a lot of scamming happening in the business at the moment with, you know, like I say to people often in the meetings that we've been having recently, just because you can tokenize something doesn't mean you should. Um, so we've taken that approach creatively and, and trying to really think that through and you know, who knows if that approach will be successful, but we're trying to be mindful of all of the challenges and the problems and using our experiences as game makers to make sure buzzwords like NFT and utility actually become real things that we explain to players so they understand the value of it and understand how they can build a business for themselves and make profit for themselves and just be more deeply engaged in the games that we make and with the partners that we have. So that's how we... I think about it slightly differently than some. I see, thank you. I see that Artem has a question, so feel free to ask. Yeah, sure. Uh, so I was just gonna ask, uh, what are your thoughts on some like new uh, financial models like Apple Arcade is doing? Like when you, uh, you know, you, you pay a subscription and you play a bunch of games versus, you know, uh, like paying for each game as it used to be back in, I don't know, several years ago. Yeah, it's it's great. I use Apple Arcade. I think it gives people, obviously, you know, broad access to many different games for a fixed price that they're comfortable with, you know. We often joke in games, it's really hard to get people to spend two bucks, but we'll drop four on a coffee. So it's like, it's about perceptions and value, right? Um, I think Apple done a terrific job. Um, Microsoft seeing huge growth in, in their subscription service uh, too, where you know you pay a fee and you jump in and play many games, not just old games and catalog, but new games too. And, and actually it works particularly well for single player story-based games and, and, and interactive narrative because 
it's not free to play. You're not, you know, you're not on that content treadmill and those store drops and those season drops and those releases. It's a, a often a, a beautiful movie like experience that you can be by yourself and enjoy, uh, but a very challenging thing to do in a traditional sense because often in some of the data that I saw, you know, you could sell 200,000 copies, which might just about get your development cost back, but then four and a half million people watched it on YouTube. So yeah, that's, that's bad economics. <laughs> but what it shows is there's an enormous audience for the thing that you made. And so if you're paid by a subscription service to, to contribute content like that, it's, it's an interesting way to cover that because the, the people who make those games are, are paid on an engagement model as I referenced earlier, similar to how Netflix runs the business, right? So we could have a conversation here collectively about which movies and shows that we collectively love or hate, but Netflix sees the engagement data and as well, we're going to make a sequel. And you might think, well, wait, why are they making a sequel? Oh, that's terrible. It's because they have the numbers, they, they know who watched, they know who completes, they look at it from a taste cluster perspective based on other shows and other films and in aggregate, that's really interesting. Um, so I think, you know, akin to Netflix, um, it's it's fascinating. And I think it works well for some games better than others. World of Warcraft is really one of the only enormously successful sub-model games. A number of people tried afterwards, it didn't work out. You know, they were first mover advantage and, and kind of the only, in the end, uh, the free-to-play model became de facto norm. All right, I'll move along. All right, Pete. Yeah. Um, we have one question from William. And okay. to let you know, um, we can end at 7.35 if that works for you. Uh, so about yeah, that, that's fine. Yeah, I, I can get through my last slides pretty quickly. All right, sounds good. William, you can quickly ask your question. Thanks. Um, hi, Pete. Um, since we have you here, and thanks for being here, do you have like a special code for like for us to register it as a player in Blancos? Um, I think you just go to blancos.com and download the launch and you can get in. I mean, I do have like a special like um, if we get the link from you, we can get like special. I don't know. Um, oh, yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. I, can, I can figure something out. Yeah, sure. But I'll have, to do, it I'll have to do it after this. Yeah. Um, yeah, cool. That's a good idea. Let me let me look into that. Um, So I think we just covered this. And again, you know, we're running out of time today. Um, we've talked about game assets and the value of that for players and the shared revenue success in these communities and the time spent. You can make money for your investments of your time and creativity. Um, and then bring that together with speculators and influencers. You could do Twitch drops with influencers. There's all different ways to, to bring those game communities together inside and Jill, outside. Like right now. Yeah, fine. <laughs> and, um, and then social tokens. Very interesting way to raise money. Uh, you're seeing it with some sports teams in Europe. Formula One have been giving it some consideration. Um, it's a way to buy tokens to show your appreciation of, of, of a, a community or a team or a, it could be a game team or a sports team. And then you can be engaged quite deeply because you have this investment and you're really working that through. Um, with the colors that the team wear or the, if it's a racing driver, the colors of his helmet for the race, there's ways to build these connections and raise money. So lots of fascinating things happening. And, uh, you know, that's the world we've been living in for two years and we're about to release um, our game and our marketplace in May and June, and then some more partners later in the year. So a lot of these theories and all of these concepts are going to start coming to market and then we'll have the data to figure out how and where, or if it isn't, or is working and, and invest and double down where we see a lot of success. And in the early version of our game, we're seeing some pretty interesting metrics that I've certainly never seen before, which give us um, some pretty interesting things to, to go on. And collecting things like in our game, you can keep them in the box or you can get them out of the box, kind of like the physical world. And so we're seeing people buy two of everything, um, one for the box, one to jump out and play and level up and, and, uh, increase them in value from a gameplay perspective and then we're building a marketplace to allow you know players to trade trade these things together and then outside of the game too it's pretty cool and we're seeing a lot of conversation about 
uh, a Blanco that we make called Golden Ticket, of which there's only one. There is a one of one, and uh, we we know the person who has it, and he was on our Discord community channel the other day talking about it. He had the had the character there, and that was pretty awesome because quite rare to have a one of one item in a game, and it was so cool to see the whole community show up just to see that one character because there's no other way to see it anywhere else. That was pretty amazing for us. So that's Blancos, and that's what I've been working on. I talked about Minecraft Story Mode, my last career snapshot. That was the single largest entertainment deployment in Netflix history. Uh, and again, a perfect home for, for an interactive title on this platform. Um, the business model of, of single player games for a premium price point was, was failing rapidly. And, you know, whether it's services like the one I described for what Microsoft have done, what Apple Arcade is, and what Netflix are doing, investing in interactive was a fascinating project and so cool to work with Netflix. We learned so much about how they think about audience and engagement very differently from games and, and learn a hell of a lot. And I'll try and get you guys a connection and a code for our game. I think it's a cool idea. And then in May, you can jump in and play, and play together and uh, realize the uh, walk the walk of a lot of my uh, talk the talk today, which is a big thing. And I think just generally, Everything I've talked about today to me is about when machines and creativity and people come together. Um, you know, as a chess player, it's been amazing to see how chess has grown in popularity despite the power of machines. Like they're unbeatable, right? Because they don't make mistakes. Any grandmaster or current world champion, Magnus Carlsen, can't beat a machine on a phone, which is more powerful than Deep Blue back in the 90s. And I think the augmentation between humans and machines has really created some of the best chess I've been seeing for a long time. You know, nine uh, of the uh, current players are rated over 2,800, and there's only 13 grandmasters in history have held that rating. So I think that's indicative of what happens when people and machines come together. It's a really powerful thing creatively because machines have no taste. They have no point of view, but we still, certainly not yet, Alpha Zero is getting pretty close to playing like a person. Uh, but it's... In terms of that human creativity and interaction, it's never been more popular. So that concern generally that machines are going to wipe out all of our jobs and all of us game makers are going to be out of business is certainly not on the near horizon um, because that, that human interaction is critical. And the full circle story was, I mentioned the emerging technology in black and white in terms of artificial intelligence in in creatures and game worlds. Well, it was, it was the creators of black and white became the founding team and the vast majority of what DeepMind is today. Um, really amazing after working with them 20 years ago to visit DeepMind in London and see all of my old colleagues who used to make games with me in black and white all now working at DeepMind, building these systems and game worlds to test and do research. So that's the final quote from Gary Kasparov, you know, why settle for thinking like a human if you can be a god? So I think all of these platforms and tools and intelligence, when they come together with human creativity and enable that, it's a... Pretty amazing thing. I think the next 10 years is probably the most exciting um, that I've seen in games. So super excited. So, I tried to cover 40 years of emerging technologies in games, and uh, that was my final slide. So, that thank was, you very much. That was really great, Pete. Thank you so much for taking the time to share your insights. And we really appreciate it. I think I'm going to go celebrate and play video games. So thank you so much, Pete. Yeah, well, I hope it was fun and you know, there was a big crowd of people today. I hope you found it informative and yeah, really cool questions. I enjoyed it, it was fun. Yeah, thank you, it was really great. All right, thanks folks. Right, have a nice day with you. Bye. All right, so the April 5th assignment and the project assignment nine is due this Sunday, 11.59 p.m. And then this is just another reminder to sign up for the event happening this, I think, it, yeah, it's this Wednesday, 6 to 7 p.m. Uh, we invited Paul from Pantera, uh, who is a partner at Pantera Capital, to talk to us about um, firm's venture capital and also the hedge funds investment. So if you have time, please sign up and please uh, go to the event because it can be a very unique opportunity for you to hear from the career insights uh, from the leaders in the industry. So yeah, so please sign up.
for the event. Also, uh, the attendance check. So I will also post the link in the chat. Um, but yeah, so I will leave it here for until 40 for you guys to fill that out. All right, I think we can move on as we have the link in the chat. But feel free um, to ask us to come back to this slide if you still need it. Okay, so we'll be having discussion today and uh, I will open the rooms now and please join the room that you're assigned to and PM me if you need me to move you to the room that you're in.